I'm not a technology geek, as you can see. There we go. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Okay, this is, yeah, well, this is not a technological issue. This is already a very nice example of a gender issue because these things were not made to fit women's clothing. I'm not wearing trousers, I don't have pockets. But anyway, it doesn't matter, I will hold it. So there we go. I'm going to answer two questions here. The first one is why is femininity ignored in healthcare? And the second one, why is masculinity ignored in healthcare? Because I thought we should be equal towards men and women. Now, let's start with the women first, obviously. My question is, who thinks men die most often of heart diseases? Please raise your hands. Who thinks it's the men who die most often? You are completely wrong, people, when you raised your hand, because it's women who die most often of heart diseases. Why don't we know this? Well, because we associate heart diseases with men, because women are protected against heart diseases by their hormonal system up until the time when they enter menopause. So when you hear about young people dying of heart diseases, most of them, it's not because they play soccer, it's because they're men and men play soccer. And so you hear about these soccer players dropping dead in the field when they're still very young. Yes, this can happen to men and it's very unlikely to happen to women. But once women reach the menopause, their numbers start to raise dramatically. And in the end, more women die of heart diseases than men do. Now, not only do more women die of heart diseases than men do, they also have completely different symptoms when they have a heart attack. Look at the right side of the slide. It has the symptoms of a heart attack of men. Chest discomfort, pain in the arm, sharpness of breath. Who knows these symptoms? Who is aware of them? I suppose most people, yes, because they are the well-known symptoms of heart disease. But look at the left side. Women, they start vomiting, feel nausea. They feel jaw pain, back pain. Whom of you knew that these were symptoms for women to have heart diseases? Not many people do, because it's not wildly known. And why is it not wildly known? Because the Euro Heart Study showed that only 33% of trials participants are women. And that approximately half of the trials do not even report an analysis on the resu results by gender. This means that we don't do any medical testing on women or very little medical testing on women. And women, and at the same time we have to conclude that more women than men die of heart diseases. So we should include them in our trials, but we don't. And as the doctor says here, we have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys and men with this condition. But medical research using women as subjects never, just never occurred to anybody. Now, why don't we do as much medical research on a female body as a male body? Well, then we should start with mice. It's a story of mice and men. Because as we all know, when you're developing new drugs, you first want to test them on animals to make sure that they work, and then you're going to start human trials, and then they're approved, and then patients can start taking those drugs. Now, already at the level of the mice, there is a big problem. Why? They only test drugs on male mice. And you know why? It's because the hormonal system of male bodies is a lot simpler than female bodies. And I've spoken to many laboratory researchers all over Europe and they told me that the reason why they choose these male mice and not two cages is because it will, would double the amount of work that they have. You know, not only do you have to feed two batches of mice, you have to clean the cages twice, you have to record all the results twice. And actually, why do they choose them for men and not female mice? The reason is because you're much more likely to find a new drug that works on a male body because it's a lot more simpler than a female hormonal system, so they choose the male mice. And then they move on to the trials among humans, and again, they only or mostly test it on male bodies because they're much more easier to, you, you much more easily get results. Women are much more likely to develop complications because their hormones are so, so difficult. This means that women who start taking a new drug are actually at a much higher risk than men who start taking a new drug. Because if you're a patient and you're going for a new medicine 
then you're actually most likely maybe the first female body that this drug is used upon. And so obviously we see the statistics that there are many more um, problems with drugs occurring in women than in men. So we should start taking biological differences between the female and the male body seriously and we should give them equal attention in research. And this should really change. And I'm very happy to hear from Sarah that she was involved in two medical trials. So to the women out there, we also have to do our share. Please go for medical trials if you have the opportunity, but insist that when they publish articles about it, that they differentiate according to sex in the results. Because it's not just a matter of involving women in the research, it's also very important that you actually publish those results and that you differentiate them. And by the way, Disease number one that men die of is cancer. And most of the time people think it's the reverse. That it would be the women dying of cancer and a man of heart disease, but it's not the truth. Because a lot of attention is also given to women, uh, f typical female cancers, and this is why, like breast cancer, uh, etc. And this is why we associate cancer with women, but it's the men who die most often of cancer and not the women. Now. It's not a whole complete rosy picture with the men either. So let's turn to them. So what about the price of masculinity in healthcare? It looks as if at first sight you would think men are lucky because they belong to the sex that is taken as the norm in medical research. Hooray! However, behaving like a man might be a health risk as well. Just look at this little the picture of the cap. It says, because it's small lettering, it says soccer is for wimps. My kid raises motocross. Now, in the United States, this is true because soccer indeed is for wimps. Real men, they play, you know, maybe motocross or uh, football, you know, the, the, the American sport. What we call soccer, football, here is very masculine. It really changes culturally. But we do promote among men that they should behave in a very macho, strong way. And we think it's funny, but it's not so funny because it comes at a very high price. And this is what I want to talk to you about. Society tends to accept and even reward men who behave competitive, harsh, rough, tough. We call them real men. And society tends to punish men who are emotional, open, warm, connected. We call them wimps. And look, even President Obama could not escape that stigma that he was called a wimp. Just by the way he, how he throws the ball was enough to give him that label. Since most men, of course, don't like to be called wimps, they try to live up to the expectations imposed by them, to them, or upon them by society. And so they think, well, we should behave what society tells us that real men should behave like. And then, of course, the one on the right, I like that one very much, because obviously it's always the mothers who are to blame, as we all know. You know, there's a source, they are the source of all evil. So, but this typical macho male behavior is not for free. Men pay a terrible price. And the quote up there says, masculinity is not something given to you, but something you gain. And you gain it by winning small battles with honor. You know, this is bullshit. Masculinity is given to you, actually when you're born, you're a boy or a girl, or something in between, obviously, with intersexual conditions. But it's given to you. You shouldn't earn it, but this is what we tell men, that they're not good enough, unless if they prove something. And then, you know, see, look, look at what happens to them. This is awful. You don't want to be one of those, do you? Now, what has happened to men? Just three weeks ago, the University of Ghent published a study about alcohol abuse in Belgium. And they actually calculated the societal cost of alcohol in our country. And it amounted to 4.2 billion in Belgium. So this is the cost related to, for example, if you're a drunken driver and you kill somebody. You know, that's a very high cost to society. Or if you're sitting at a cafe, you're completely drunk, and you hit a couple of other guys, and they are wounded and have to be taken to the hospital. Obviously, that costs a lot of money, the healthcare, etc. So all of these costs together, related directly to alcohol abuse, amount to 4.2 billion in Belgium. And we're going through an economic crisis. 
and look at what we pay each year for alcohol abuse. Now, just as a comparison, cancer only costs us 3.1 billion. And diabetes, a disease that was mentioned a lot today because it is on the rise with our aging population, diabetes amounts to 3.5 billion. So alcohol abuse is heads and tails above those two diseases. In Belgium, and we are a very small country with a population of only about 11 million, I think, right now, there are about 900,000 persons with an alcohol problem and only 8% seeks help because it's a very big taboo still. Now, let us insert the variable sex into this data. And what do we get? 10% of persons drinking alcohol do it in a problematic way. That's those 900,000 people. But among those problematic drinkers, drinkers two-thirds are men. And that is no coincidence. It is because we push men to drink. We tell them as a society that you're a real man if you go drinking. And just look at that advertisement up there for that popular Belgian beer, Jupiler, that says, men know why. You know, if we st keep on spreading these messages, we keep on telling men, you're not a real man, unless if you start drinking. And drinking is okay. Don't worry about it. It's part of being men. Boys will be boys. Not just alcohol abuse is very costly in our society. Just look at the suicide figures. In Belgium, and unfortunately we're at the top of the world, around 2,000 people commit suicide every year. And among those, two-thirds are men. Why? They don't seek help. It's a big taboo for men to go to a therapist to talk about their emotional problems. They're not even supposed to have emotions, let alone to have emotional problems. Where can they turn to? Not towards other men, because they're very busy behaving like real men and pushing other men and emotionality away from them. So what do we end up with a society where two-thirds of the suicides are male? So let's break this taboo that men would not have emotions or emotional problems. And let's help these men and embrace them in dealing with their emotions and learning to deal with them so that we can lower this figure because this is a terrible cost. Not just for these men, but also for the people around them who love them and wanted them to, be, to, to stay longer with them. Now, violence, accidents, alcohol abuse, suicide, if we look at Euro 27, so the 27 member states of Europe together, the death rate is higher for men than women in all age ranges due to these types of things happening. I'm just going to pick out one figure here, this one. In the age range of 50 to 4 to 44, we have a rate of male death of 236%. That's incredible. Those are all these guys just getting their driver's license and then just running their cars into trees or getting their motos driving license and, 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 and just having these terrible moto accidents. These are the guys committing suicide, etc. It's 236% higher than women dying in that age range. And what does it amount to? The situation persists across the majority of conditions and should, on biological grounds, affect men and women equally. Normally, we should have an equal death rate among men and women, and we don't. Annually, in Europe, 630,000 male deaths occur in working age men as compared to only 300,000 among women. Obviously, we cannot avoid that. Some people will die before the age of 65, but it shouldn't be that 330,000 men die more than women. That means we have a problem in society. And this is a huge cost that we pay for promoting a type of masculinity that leads men straight into destruction. This is not what we wish for our husbands, our sons, our nephews, our uncles, fathers. We want to embrace them. And we want to live them a long and healthy life, as a lot of women already do. And this is what we should po point out. It's such a big taboo still in our society. So, to conclude, is this the price we want to pay for being called real men? I don't think so. And both men and women should try to change this taboo and to change this picture. So, yes, 
Let us pay attention to the differences in the female and the male body to increase the quality of healthcare. That's very important, especially for the women. But no, let us no longer push men into a masculinity that is harmful for their health. I wish you still a very happy day. And don't forget to embrace at least two men still today because they really need it. Thank you very much.